good to go? Everyone, can you please take your seats? Please take your seats, everyone. Welcome to our winter meeting of the Democratic National Committee. I hereby call this meeting to order. My friends, it's so good to be back in person with you all. We had the president in the building this week, and I can think of no better way to close out this weekend than with another special guest. Just back from Poland and Romania, where she has been standing up for democracy, Vice President Kamala Harris. So let's have a great meeting today, and let's close this week out strong. Now we will have a presentation of colors. And please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance once they are established. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members, our invocation today will be led by Sarah Levin of our Interfaith Council. Please welcome our friend, Sarah Levin. We have Sarah. Oh, excuse me. Actually, modification. Uh, our invocation today will be led by AME Bishop uh, Samuel Green from the great state of South Carolina. Please welcome our friend Bishop Green. Let us pray. We have gathered together to strategize with intentional aim to reclaim America from the clutches of those whose skewed view of a better America excludes the majority of America. As Americans of goodwill and democratic consciousness, we recognize that after a long and chaotic, bitter and tragic season of malignant government from an apprentice president, we are all desiring to experience the possibility of a better country. That is to say, a country not mired in the recrimination of racism, a country where women can get equal pay for equal work, 
a country where children can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, freedom and dignity for their souls. In the founding documents of this nation, there is talk of a more perfect union. But just like other systems of government, there is no perfect or perfection in democracy. Democracies are inherently imperfect. The very idea that people can govern themselves brings with it all of the complexities and fallibilities that come along with being human. We know America will never be perfect, and because of it, she will never be more perfect either. But we stand firm in our belief that this country can be better. We know we have it within us, the capacity to be a better version of what we are. The Democratic Party refused to give into pessimism. We still believe that we can have better policing, better schools, better health care, better jobs, a better understanding of what it is best about the American spirit. We know that America can never be perfect, but she can be better. And indeed, she must be better. From 2016 to 2020, this country had become the worst of its past. But we, the Democratic Party, demanded something better, a better country. This is what we desired and desire. This is what we have fought for down through the years. This desire is what drove a black woman born in Oakland, California, to two immigrant parents not to give up on her future in spite of the indignity she had to face. This is what lifted a man from Stratton, Pennsylvania, out of the clutches of obscurity and set him on a path to redeem the soul of a nation. This is why people marched across the South. This is why John Lewis was willing to bleed on a bridge not for trickle-down economics, not for proliferation of war, not for sectarian xenophobic politics, but for a better country. And we will achieve it, not with optimism, but with hope. Today, we reject optimism as the basis of our future political possibilities because optimism is rooted in a sense of inevitability. The optimist says that things will get better, but that's just how things are. But our hopefulness is something different. Our hopefulness is to admit the potential of failure, even as we maintain our determination to bend the future of America in right directions. Yes, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice if we are willing to bend it. Freedom is not inevitable. It must be achieved. To be hopeful is to be willing to work for a better tomorrow and then pray that the forces greater than ourselves would aid us in our cause. We dare to work to achieve the best for this country with hope, with faith, with civility, and with a dogged determination. And the reward of this work won't just be a better America, but, a, but rather a nation wherefore God is not ashamed to be called our God. That is the great reward. We must work to make this country as good as its promise. If for no other reason than certainly because our desire is to become a country that the God of our different faiths can be proud of. And so with hope and love, we set out to heal America, to pull a nation forward. And we are here highly resolved that this work would not be done in vain because Martin Luther King Jr. is watching us, because Rosa Parks is watching us, because Eleanor Roosevelt is watching us, Cesar Chavez is watching us, because the Trayvon Martins, the Philanders Castiles, the Sandra Blands, the Tamir Rices, the Emmanuel Nines, the George Floyds and Breonna Taylors are watching us because Joseph Lowry, C.T. Vivian, and John Lewis are watching us. The God of our many faiths, the God of history is watching us. God is willing us forward. God, give us the strength to keep going, 
We know if we keep moving forward, we will soon discover that midnight must give away to morning time. And it's morning time. Thank you, God, because we see that springtime is coming in America again. We will not give up on tomorrow. We will not go back. We dare settle for jaundiced leaders. Thank you, God, that the Democratic Party still believe that what self-centered men have torn down, men and women other-centered can and will build up again. The soul of America is being revived and restored. Be with our DNC Chair Harrison and his family, the entire executive committee, and every DNC member. Keep our President Joseph Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris in your protective care. Guide our U.S. representatives and senators as they stand strong to save America against destructive forces. Give us the strength and the tenacity to continue to fight against voter suppression. And in every other and every other and every other injustice that plague our nation and local communities. God help our children. Teach us to teach them how to live together in harmony. Help us to lead in creating relief to struggling families who are finding it impossible to survive on yesterday's salaries at today's prices. Help us to be more sensitive to the pain and the disillusionment of our neighbor who does not live next door or in our neighborhood. Guide us in mobilizing an electorate to put in place conscientious leaders with the aim to include and not exclude. Shape our thoughts and actions to be consistent with our mission. And as we leave this meeting today, give us traveling mercies back to our respective homes and good health to continue to fight the fight as we continue to create good trouble for the soul of America. This we pray in the name of our many faiths, God. On this day, amen. Now, uh, now y'all see how we do it in South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop. My friends, I now want to introduce DNC Secretary Jason Raitt. Jason has been committed to this party since long before he had a driver's license. From county party meetings in Wisconsin to his tenure as secretary, his commitment has been unshakable. We are lucky to have him at the DNC. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Jason Raitt. Good morning, fellow Democrats. We can do that better. Good morning. Good morning. It is absolutely wonderful to see all of you here this morning. Thank you for making the travels across the country and for some across the globe to be here for our first in-person meeting in two years. Since we last gathered in August of 2019 in San Francisco, we've had a number of new members of the DNC who have been elected and taken office. So I'd actually ask all of our new members who this is their first in-person meeting to please stand to be recognized. We are so excited to have you all as a part of our DNC family and welcome. If you are, uh, I'm gonna call them a seasoned member and you see an individual near you who stood, Please take a moment to introduce yourself if you have not already. Uh, serve as a mentor uh, and welcome people to the DNC. But Mr. Chairman, uh, as we can see from across the room today, uh, we are fired up and ready to go and we do indeed have a quorum of members present today. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We indeed have a quorum. 
Now, I would like to introduce the vice chair of the D.C. Democratic Party, Linda Gray. You know, Vice Chair Gray used to be a school principal, and she likes to joke that this experience comes in handy sometimes in meetings like this. But in all seriousness, Linda Gray is a true public servant. She made a career serving her students, and she continues to be an advocate for the people of the District of Columbia. Vice Chair Gray, thank you for all that you do, and thank you for welcoming us to your great city. My friends, please join me in welcoming Vice Chair Linda Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that introduction. Good morning, Democrats, colleagues, and friends. Welcome to Washington, D.C. It is so good to see all of you and thank you for making the decision to attend in person. Our work is too important to remain locked in a virtual world. Welcome to our city that is home to over 700,000 residents. Our home that everyone loves to visit for vacation, for sports, entertainment, for cultural experiences, for higher education, for jobs, for entrepreneurial opportunities, to raise families, to engage politically. It is a city that has something for everyone. It is where we are back to calling the president and the vice president our neighbors. With this being Women's History Month, we applaud that we have Kamala Harris, the first black woman as Vice President of the United States. Our warrior on the Hill, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is a native Washingtonian and has served our city since 1991. Our mayor, Muriel Bowser, a third-generation Washingtonian who is seeking her third history-making term. Our city council, comprised of 13 members, has a majority of seven women. As vice chair of the D.C. Democratic Party, I am a fifth-generation Washingtonian, and also putting myself out there to be the shadow U.S. representative to fight for statehood. So if you are a registered D.C. Democrat and you haven't signed my petition, please see me when this is over. <laughs> we are excited about history in the making as Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is confirmed to be the first black woman justice on the Supreme Court. And just a little note. Yes, she may have been raised in Florida, but she was born in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Women in our city are not shy when it comes to activism and service. I hope you've enjoyed the winter meeting and have what you need to take back to your states to create new strategies and to have the needed conversations about the work that is in front of us. President Biden set the tone in the State of the Union address, and for us this week, Chairman Harrison has let us know that he is fired up and ready for the challenge of the midterms. Hopefully, we will return for several meetings towards the midterms. After all, the headquarters for the DNC is right here. Now, the struggle is real when it comes to saving our democracy. Now, this is the part of my speech when I'm going to date myself. I hope I don't regret it, but I think it's for a good reason. When I was a child, I remember when residents of the District of Columbia could not vote for the President of the United States. In 1961, the 23rd Amendment was ratified, and D.C. was granted three votes in the Electoral College. Our first elected body was the Board of Education in 1968. 
Our first non-voting delegate to Congress was elected in 1971, Walter Cronchor. I was in the 10th grade. The Home Rule Act was passed in 1973. I was a senior in high school. In 1978, Congress actually granted DC voting representation, but it failed because of a seven year expiration date and because only 16 states had ratified the amendment. It was also the year that we had our first mayoral election. It was my first political experience and campaign that I worked in. My neighbor, friend, and mentor, and some of you may remember, Dr. Merlin Tyler Brown, introduced me to politics. I am now a retired DC Public Schools high school principal and nothing has changed in the District of Columbia with respect to the attitudes of those who actively participate in the disenfranchisement of the District of Columbia residents, despite our repeated attempts in Congress and despite the overwhelming support of Americans for statehood. To be factual, the more than 700,000 population of the District of Columbia is larger than two states, Wyoming and Vermont. DC residents pay higher federal taxes per capita than any resident of any state. In terms of any federal funding of the budget, that comes to about 20% of the proposed DC spending, which puts DC towards the low end of how much our budget is appropriated by the federal government. And any other special funding that we may receive is usually a reimbursement for security related to protests. And on a special note, DC has its own National Guard, but we can't call our own National Guard. But had we been a state, if we were a state, on that dreadful January the 6th, if we had been able to call the National Guard, that insurrection would have never happened. We now face the threat of having home rule taken away if Representative Andrew Clyde has his way to repeal the 1973 DC Home Rule Act. Again, I remind you, and dating myself, that when we received home rule, I was a senior in high school. The federal government doesn't take care of us. We take care of ourselves. Representation, taxation without representation is unconstitutional. Injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And I share that notable quote in solidarity with my good friend, Charlie Rodriguez, chair of the Puerto Rico Democratic Party. I want to take this time to thank the Eastern Regional Caucus who helped us to push statehood to all state parties. And I want to publicly thank Ken Martin and ASDC for the vote that was taken in December of 2019 in Austin, Texas to support full voting rights and statehood for the District of Columbia. In other words, that means that every single Democratic state party in the country supports statehood. And I would like to say, state parties may change, but the vote does not. It is a matter of record. I want to thank the DNC 
for including statehood on the platform in 2016. I want to thank Madam Vice President and President Joe Biden for their support for voting rights and statehood for the District of Columbia. Mr. Chair, this has been an honor to speak to our colleagues today, and I thank you for the, inv the invitation and the opportunity. The next time that you're greeted by someone from D.C., it may not be me. I would love for it to be me, but it may not be me. But I most certainly hope that whoever stands here and welcomes you, I hope that they're able to use the words, welcome to Washington Douglas Commonwealth, the 51st state. Thank you so much. Stay healthy and stay blessed. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and you should know that we are all committed to making sure that D.C. becomes the 51st state. Now I'm pleased to ask our, uh, our Resolutions Committee, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Resolutions Committee, Rich Fitzgerald from Pennsylvania, to come to present and report uh, the re uh, to present at the report of the Resolutions Committee. Now, uh, Rich is uh, new to this role, but he is not a stranger to resolutions business and democratic pro processes more broadly. He currently serves as the county executive for Allegheny County helping uh, in Pennsylvania, helping the region navigate a new economy while supporting a transparent and engaging local democratic process. Please welcome uh, resolutions co-chair, Rich Fitzgerald. Good morning, Democrats, and thank you, Chairman Harrison, for the opportunity to co-chair the Resolutions Committee with Patrice Taylor, longtime DNC staffer. Uh, Patrice is not able to join us for today's meeting due to a last-minute unexpected conflict, but she sends her regards to everyone. On behalf of the Re Resolutions Committee, I want to express our appreciation to the members who submitted resolutions. I also want to thank those DNC staff members who worked with me and Patrice to verify the accuracy of the amendments and to make sure that they reinforce our party's values, support the work of President Biden and Vice President Harris, and appropriately honor individuals whose lives made a difference in our nation and in our world. The Resolutions Committee met on Thursday, March 10th, to consider 44 resolutions sent to the DNC members in the Secretary's 14-day mailing. The committee is recommending 21 message resolutions and 21 commemorative resolutions for approval by the DNC. Along with the resolutions recommended by the Resolutions Committee, this resolutions packet includes an urgently timed resolution considered by the Executive Committee at its meeting this morning. The resolution is in support of Texas transgender youth and their families the Executive Committee is recommending approval of the resolution by the DNC. <laughs> Among the resolutions considered and recommended for adoption are Resolution 2A, supporting the nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson to the United States Supreme Court. Resolution number three, in support of President Biden standing strong with our allies in the face of Russian aggression. Resolution number four, about the Republican National Committee's defense of the January 6th insurrectionist. Resolution number 13, pertaining to anti-Asian hate. Resolution number 24, honoring the life and career of Senator Harry Reid. Resolution number 25, honoring the life and career of Senator Max Cleland. 
and resolution number 39, honoring the life and career of Congresswoman Carrie Meek. With that, Mr. Chair, I make a motion to move the approval of resolutions as recommended by the Resolutions Committee reported to the National Committee. Thank you. The Resolutions Committee has given its report and moved. It, it's approved by membership. It, it's been checked. Is there any discussion? Uh, the, we have been second. Call the question. All those in favor of approving the report of the Resolutions Committee say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the Resolutions Committee report is adopted. Thank you so much, Rich. Thanks, Patrice, as well, for all of the hard work coming out of the Resolutions Committee. On the next item of business, I would like to introduce two good friends of mine to present reports on the DNC's finances. National Finance Chair Chris Corge and Treasurer Virginia McGregor have been working tirelessly to support all of the hard and necessary work we do here at the DNC. I'm looking forward to hearing of our record-setting halls, as well as our investments in the future of the party through things like our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. I'm looking forward to great work still to come. Uh, and with that, Chris and Virginia, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. First of all, let me welcome you. What a great weekend this has been. I mean, this has literally, literally been flawless. As the chair said, my name's Chris Korge. I'm your national finance chairman. I'm here with Virginia McGregor, our fantastic DNC treasurer. And she will join me to tell you how we're gonna spend the money. My job is to raise it. Now on Thursday, the Budget and Finance Committee co-chaired by Doris Krausmays and Henry Munoz, met, reviewed the budget, and received a proposal from the College Democrats regarding youth organizing. While the resolution from the College Dems did not move forward, we were inspired by their remarks. They really impressed many of us, and we want them and you all to know that we are committed to paying attention to the DNC's commitment to the youth organizing in this country. Nothing could be more critical than that. So I want to I want to direct your attention to slide number two, fundraising 2021. I'm not sure I can can't see it. There it is. After the 2020 election, the DNC was in an unprecedented position that allowed us to create a permanent infrastructure to support Democratic candidates and avoid, to re and avoid having to rebuild every four years the infrastructure. And I spoke to many of you about this. This is our mission. Last year, we raised 154 million, nearly two and a half times the amount we had raised in each of the last two post-presidential years we elected a Democrat. As you will hear shortly, this level of support is going to allow us to make the earliest investments in staffing, organizing, tools and resources that we've ever ever made. It's a game changer for us, but as we talk about all the areas we invested in a little later with Virginia, I will also stress that we need even greater fundraising numbers in 2022. The next slide will be familiar to some of you, but it is important reminder of the incredible ways people have been turning out to support the DNC. Listen to some of these incredible numbers. We have one million donors. <clears throat> this has never been done before. Imagine a million people that are going to continue to give and many of them give every month. 
We have 310,000 new donors. Almost 7 million raised by text. And incidentally, just last month, we more than doubled our goal in major donor fundraising, raising $7.2 million. So moving to the budget, I want to show you the next slide, which deals with cash. Later this month, we are excited and proud to report to the FEC that we have raised, we have, excuse me, 90, uh, $59 million in the bank. That's the headline number that gets the attention, but it's not the whole story. As you can see on this chart, the DNC has five times the amount of cash that it had at the same time last cycle. Five times the amount of cash. But it's important to understand that only a portion of our cash is free and clear of FEC restrictions on spending. The blue slices of the column show the portion of funds that are unrestricted and can be used for, for any purpose. The much larger orange slices are limited by the FEC. The takeaway here is that our financial status, while strong, is not in a place where we can coast. And anybody that knows me knows I'm not a coaster. <laughs> and we wouldn't want to. I mean, who would want to coast? Because coasting is not how you win elections. It's how you lose them. We've placed a heavy emphasis on strengthening our resources for Democratic candidates to access but the most valuable resource is time. And if you look at this, we only have 241 days left. While laying the foundation for the, 200, uh, for the 2024 presidential election, we know that we are battling history. Folks, we constantly raise money the last four months, as you can see from the graph in Senate races the bulk of our money. We cannot do that. We cannot build infrastructure by doing it that way. The challenge is simply that historically funds come in at the end of an election cycle while the investing needed start more than a year in advance. It's impossible to play catch up. What ends up happening is campaigns suffer from it and they've suffered in the past. Before I turn this over to Virginia to give the report on how we're spending money, I just want to ask each and every one of you to do one simple thing, and I'm going to ask the chairman right here to send out an email with a link. Every member of the DNC needs to be a contributor. I don't care how big or small your, I like bigger ones, but I don't care how big your, your, how small your contribution is. Everyone, when we go and meet donors, we need to be able to tell them that every single member of the DNC is an investor in what we're doing. Thank you all very much. And Virginia, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Chris. You know, before we dive into our midterm strategy, I just want to tell you, we're going to be talking about a lot of numbers. But as Chris said, there's one number that really matters, and that is 241. Because there are only 241 days until the midterm elections on November 8th. And we're going to need every single one of those days to continue the momentum that Democrats are building. Like Chris said, our most valuable resource is time. We can't get any of these 241 days back. At the DNC, we have been hard at work building out a strategy that positions Democrats up and down the ballot and across the country to win. Because President Joe Biden said in his State of the Union speech last week, democracies are rising to the moment and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security. And in this country, 
It is the Democratic Party that protects democracy. <clears throat> and it's the Democratic Party that helps build a world of peace and security. And we cannot do it without your support. In my hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, where my husband and I have a steel manufacturing plant that's been in business for over 103 years, I see firsthand how important a vibrant economy is. As a fourth generation company with strong partnership with the Iron Workers Union, I know how much of a difference President Biden's investment in the labor union will make. I also think about the world we're building for our six children and three grandchildren every single day. I'm like many of you. I'm a parent, I'm a business owner, I'm involved in my community, and I'm an advocate. And I want to make sure that the people are taken care of and that they have a sense of dignity and a sense of purpose. I started my work in politics on grassroots campaigns in Scranton and across Pennsylvania. So I know how much every voice matters. And in my current role, I see the power of those voices every day. Being the DNC treasurer couldn't be a better fit, and it couldn't be a better job. It's given me the inside look that everything that goes into running successful campaigns from the school board to the president. And let me tell you, there's a lot going on behind the scenes as we prepare to maximize every single one of those 241 days. So let's dive into the first slide. We're going to start with major new investments we're making in order to lay the foundation for 2022 and 2024 and beyond. We're investing in the grassroots efforts to strengthen our party and build infrastructure to compete up and down the ballot this year and beyond. The DNC is also making historic investments in voter registration and electoral programming to support our state parties. We've partnered with state parties and sister committees to build a strong foundation for 2022 coordinated campaigns. And we've made multi-million dollar commitment across eight key states. In order to win, Democratic candidates need access to data. They need access to infrastructure. They need access for the tools for effective and secure voter and volunteer outreach. So we've already made more than $20 million in investments to support just that. All of these investments build up the infrastructure and the capacity in states to win elections up and down the ticket. Now let's dig into the details. Next slide. Chair Jamie Harrison's 50 state and seven territory strategy addresses the fact that the entire country is at stake and we're covering every single inch of it. We're working with each state party to make sure that they can invest early in tools and resources. We want to make sure they have the leadership staff in place to run crucial communications and voter registration efforts. Through the state party program, 12,500 is sent to each state party every month. We've already sent out more than 7.5 million, and by the end of the year, the states will have received nearly $15 million. You may have heard about the State Party Innovation Fund, which is a grant program that will send 5.5 million to state parties to develop new programs and ideas. And the DNC has already began making these grants. Only a few weeks after data and SPP agreements were signed, we're gonna continue moving money out the door as quickly as resources and proposals allow for it. And how about the brand new Red State Fund? Can we hear it for the Red States? which we're already has begun sending 2,500 a month to 20 red states, plus another million in dedicated investments. We'll also spend 20 million to support coordinated campaigns in key states to build infrastructure for 2022 and beyond. Next slide. All of these investments, however, rely on the cornerstone of our democracy, free and fair elections. That may sound easy, but it isn't. So to that end, we are doing all we can to protect voting rights, to educate voters, <clears throat> and to make voting registration easier. We're fighting to protect your right to vote every step of the way. And how are we doing this? Well, the DNC is involved in litigation to protect and defend unfair voting legislation. We're hiring internal staff to support those efforts. We're distributing voting registration grants to key states 
and building next generation tools, online organizing capabilities. We're getting the word out about all of this through positive press, paid media, and communications. I know these efforts matter, not just to Democrats, but to all Americans. We have seen Republicans lie, and we have seen Republicans cheat to win, and we are not going to stand by and let that happen. Next slide. To help protect the vote and engage communities, we have broadened our work with coalitions. Two years ago, this team was part of political and organizing sector and reported to its director. Most of the one work was really done by consultants or staffed by who managed multiple coalitions community. But Jamie knew that we could do better. He made a decision, along with the leadership team, to make coalitions a standalone department with its own management and full-time dedicated staff. And we took a look at how we could do better to support other departments. Next slide. As Chris said, our most valuable resource is this time. But I also think it's our staff. When we started this process, we knew two things. We needed to hire more people, and we didn't want to just hire anyone. We needed to recruit, and we needed to train and hire some of the best minds in the country. And we did, but there's more to come. The chart on this slide shows staffing by department. In 2018, our, and our current staffing, and then the staffing that we could envision, assuming we have the resources. As you can see, we currently have 272 staff on payroll. And with resources, we can get that number to 320. You'll also notice that the largest increases are in areas that we've been discussing, political and organizing, which includes coalitions, the essential voter protection team, the important digital organizing staff, and the critical technology team, which develops the tools that our staff, our state parties, and our partners rely on. Remember, all these staffing decisions were made to hire not just people, but the right people. Our team is incredible, and it's just going to keep getting better. <clears throat> so let's get to the bottom line. Let's get to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks for the record-setting support, our 2022 budget will be double what the budgets were in both 2018 and 2020. We're supporting state parties like never before. We're partnering with the DCCC and the DSCC to retain and expand our gains in the House and the Senate. We're building up our fundraising efforts so that we continue to grow to make strategic investments and to support Democratic candidates across the country. The cost to run these programs is huge, but I'm confident these decisions are the right ones. I know that everything we're doing will help protect our democracy. In the midterms, in 2024 and beyond, we're building a world we can be proud to leave to our kids and to our grandchildren. And I'm more optimistic about the future than I have ever been before. So I just want to say that today the DNC is best than it's ever been. Our financial position is strong, and Jamie and the rest of my terrific team are true visionaries. We all work together well and respect each other, and most importantly, we help each other dream big. Because let's be honest, we should all be dreaming big. Hope is one of the most powerful forces in our world. We are here today because we're putting our hope into action. We want to win the upcoming midterms, and I'm here to tell you, we are going to win. And as long as we keep up that momentum, we will. And listen, I know we all have so much going on. God only gives us a certain amount of energy to spend every day. And the only way, only we can decide how to use it. I know I'm going to be using my energy to protect our democracy and, I, and help elect Democrats. And I hope that you will too. Because remember, we're just 241 days away from the midterms and every day counts. So dream, please dream big and keep your energy up. Let's get to work. Thanks, everybody. Again, I want to thank Chris and Virginia for their amazing work and, uh, and their reports. You know, I meet every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock with Chris and Virginia to go over our finances and, uh, and also how, how we're spending dollars. So really, really appreciative of all their work. They do call time. They travel all over the country. And I want to emphasize what Chris said. 
I want to be able to say to our donors that every single member of the DNC is also a financial contributor to the DNC. So if your budget can only give you uh, is a dollar or five dollars or or a hundred thousand dollars, please, please, yes, uh, maybe even if you can do an eight seventy five, that's even better. Please, please do all that you can to support us. It's really, really important. Any good functioning organization, healthy organization, its members are also contributors to that. I know you do a lot of contribution in terms of your work and your actions. But as you know, I can't pay for all those staff with just my good looks. So I, I really, really, and I can't give state parties money uh, just off my good looks either. So please, please do what you can. Really, really appreciate that. Now I'd like to recognize, uh, don't laugh at my good looks, folks. Come on now. <laughs> I try. I'd like to now recognize the co-chairs of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Oh, am, am I, make sure I'm not skipping anything. Oh, actually, before we get that, uh, I think we have a special video, right? The time is now for the court to have its first black woman jurist. We've long earned our seat on the Supreme Court, and this is overdue. And I gladly and proudly support a black woman being nominated to the U.S. Supreme just to say that out loud for me, I, I literally get goosebumps. Black women have been ready, been qualified, been more than capable. Black women are truth tellers, fact checkers. We are the conscience of our democracy. We need the lived and learned experience of a black woman on the court because representation matters. And certainly our highest court should reflect America. She will be the first black woman to serve in the 233 year history of the Supreme Court. This is an intersectional moment for us to celebrate America living up to its promise. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize the co-chairs of the Rules and Bylaws Committee, Lorraine Miller and Jim Roosevelt to present the report of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Jeremy Lorraine. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see this room just full of Democrats. <laughs> thank you, Chair Harrison, for your kind introduction, and thank you for giving my good friend Lorraine Miller and me the opportunity to continue to serve as co-chairs of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. The RBC met Thursday and Friday, and based on those meetings, I am more than confident that this is a very strong committee with a range of views that is fully representative of our party's diversity. At our meeting on Thursday, the committee considered two proposed amendments to the bylaws. The First Amendment recognizes the change made to the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender American Caucus to update the name of the caucus to be more fully inclusive of the diversity of the entire community. This proposed amendment was unanimously approved and recommended for approval by this National Committee. The Second Amendment clarifies the role of the Resolutions Committee and its responsibility to review all resolutions proposed for consideration by the DNC, including urgent and timely resolutions. This amendment also specifies a process that allows the Executive Committee to consider resolutions between meetings of the full committee when the Resolutions Committee will not be meeting. The Rules and Bylaws Committee has unanimously approved this proposal and is recommending it for approval by this full Democratic National Committee. At our meeting, Lorraine and I announced that we will appoint a special subcommittee of RBC members to review the charter and bylaws. Over the next few months, this ad hoc committee will develop recommendations to ensure alignment between the charter and bylaws in time for the RBC to consider and recommend any proposals for consideration at the DNC's summer meeting. 
After it completes its work, this subcommittee will be dissolved. And finally, the committee considered a resolution referred to the Rules and Bylaws Committee by the Resolutions Committee. This resolution proposed a possible change to the Charter and Bylaws, and the committee voted to refer the proposal to this new special subcommittee for its review. Good morning, DNC. I, I want to echo Jim's comments about looking forward to working with our new Rules and Bylaws Committee. We have a lot of work to do over the next few years, and I am completely confident that our members will do what is necessary to make sure that the party rules are strong and focused on making the process to facilitate our winning. Our Rules and Bylaws Committee meeting on Friday, members continue to discuss uh, about our 2024 delegate selection process that started at our January 29 meeting. As you may know, every four years, the Rules and Bylaws Committee reviews, reviews the rules of our presidential nominating process. Our committee will make sure we provide opportunities to hear not only from Rules and Bylaws Committee members, but you as DNC members, state parties, and Democrats across the country. We are committed to ensure our process reflects the values of our party. And as we look at our process, there will always be rumors about what the committee may or may not be considering. But I want to assure you that the committee will hear and consider all suggestions on how we can improve our delegate selection process to best ensure the process is fully representative of our values. As Democrats, that it, makes, it maximizes the participation of Democrats and that voters are confident in our open and transparent process. Yes, that is important. The Rules and Bylaws Committee will be meeting, will be meeting at least once a month, probably twice a month. We do this in order to draft the 2024 rules and the call in time for you as DNC members to consider it at our summer meeting. With that, Mr. Chair, we move that the two proposed amendments to the bylaws be recommended by the Rules and Bylaws Committee to be approved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Rules and Bylaws Committee has given its report and moved its approval by the membership. Is there any discussion? Seeing no further questions or comments, we will move to a vote on the motion to approve the report of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. All those in favor of appro approving the reports, aye. aye. All those opposed, the ayes have it, and the Rules and Bylaws Committee report is adopted. Thank you, members. We now have another video to share with you. It's time that we build an economy that grows from the bottom up and the middle out. That's what the American Rescue Plan represents. Talk about still the impact of the American Rescue Plan, which was the first bill he passed when taking office. The unemployment rate ticked down to 3.8 percent. You're thinking, I haven't heard it be that low in a while. Well, it hasn't been that low since the pandemic began. 7.4 million jobs now created. 75 percent of adult Americans fully vaccinated and hospitalizations down by 77 percent. Most Americans can remove their mask, return to work and move forward safely. We are stronger today than we were a year ago. And we'll be stronger a year from now than we are today. This is our moment to meet and overcome the challenges of our time. And we will. 
as one people, one America, the United States of America. It's now my honor uh, to present a, a special panel. It's going to be led and moderated by our very own president of the ASDC and vice chair of the DNC, also chair of the Minnesota DFL, Ken Martin. Hello, Democrats. Oh, my gosh. we got to be louder than that. Hello, Democrats. Now, there's a lot of press out there. I want them to hear us how fired up and ready to win we are. So when I say fired up, I want to hear you say you're ready to win. Are we fired up? Are we fired up? Are we fired up? All right, that's more like it, Democrats. Now look, state parties are working hard to build a permanent, durable infrastructure to win up and down the ballot now and well into the future. Now candidates come and go, campaigns start up and shut down, but state parties remain. It's our job, the job of Democratic state parties to build to win and build to last. We're training the next generation of leaders, from activists to candidates to staffers and state party chairs to follow. We're organizing volunteers and we're talking to swing voters. We're promoting our elected officials, our party and our values on TV networks, local radio stations and in small town newspapers all across America. Now look, the Massachusetts Democratic Party has put together a blueprint to 22, a relational organizing and community building initiative to help Democrats mobilize their friends, families, and neighbors through public service actions ahead of the 2022 statewide elections. And in Indiana, the Indiana Democratic Party is getting the message out throughout their state with innovative efforts like the Democrats Deliver Town Hall series, the Republicans Divide press conferences, and the Hoosier Promise GOTV tour. To this date, the Indiana Democratic Party has visited with Democratic Indiana voters in over 55 of their 92 counties. And in Alabama, the Alabama Democratic Party has launched a deep canvassing program engaging volunteers in having in-depth conversations with voters in every corner of their state. And down in the west, in the southwest, the Democratic Party of New Mexico has launched an innovative program called Women for the Win, which is set up to engage more women in the campaign process as either volunteers or candidates. So as you can see from just these few examples, day in and day out, our Democratic state parties build a foundation that holds up our entire political coalition. We lay the groundwork for Democratic electoral victories up and down the ballot. It's not always glorious, but every day we are living, uh, delivering for our movement, despite the fact that we get none of the credit when we win and all the blame when we lose. Amen. Now, if you are a state party chair, vice chair, or executive director, I would welcome you to please stand right now for a well-deserved round of applause for your hard work. Please rise, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you to these chairs, vice chairs, and executive directors who are working hard to build this party. <laughs> now, I, listen, listen, our work would not be possible without our good friend and our fantastic chairman, Jamie Harrison. I want to give Jamie a giant amount of credit for his steadfast commitment to the work of state parties and his belief, like mine, that we win when we compete everywhere and in every zip code. His partnership has been tremendous. His belief in the work that we do day in, day out, is steadfast and unwavering. And I thank you, Jamie, for everything you're doing for state parties. So with that, I get the great privilege of bringing up three fantastic elected officials who are doing that work in each of their states as well, building to win, building to last, lifting up voices, making sure that people feel represented. The first person I get to bring up, I'm going to bring them all up at the same time, and I'll introduce them, is Ree Shu, a second-term Democratic state representative from the great state of Kansas who will speak to us about the importance of rural organizing and how Democrats in red states can hold Republicans accountable. The second person is a fantastic Secretary of State in Colorado, Colorado Jenna Griswold, 
who is serving as the youngest statewide elected in Colorado, the first Democratic Secretary of State in Colorado in 60 years, and the first Democratic women, woman Secretary of State in Colorado's history. And then the third person we're introducing, come on, <laughs> thank you. The third person is Counselor Rusi uh, Lewishun from Boston, who will speak about how we are working to protect the middle class and those that are taking advantage of us all throughout the country. Please give a big round to these fantastic, great elected officials. So, first one, Rishu. Hello, good afternoon. For those of you wondering if they got it right, yes, I am an elected official as a Democrat in Kansas. And my name is Rishu. My story is unlike every single one of my other colleagues in the Kansas legislature. I wasn't born in the United States. When I immigrated to the US, my parents and I ended up in a town of about 20,000 in the middle of Missouri. 10 years later, I chose to become a naturalized citizen. I yearned for a life that was promised to me in the ideals promulgated by our founders, made possible by grit, hard work, and determination. More than a decade after becoming a naturalized citizen, I saw the 2016 election and the impact it was having on communities across America and I knew that I couldn't sit in the, on the sidelines. I knew that I had to get engaged. When I learned that my Republican state represent, representative was gonna run without a challenger, I put my name out there. When I was told I couldn't win because of who, who I was or where I was from or what my name would look like on a ballot, I knocked more doors and wore out more shoes. When I heard from voters how tired they were of politics, I spoke to them from the heart about my views that the government must be by and for the people and not corporate special interests. Hard work, determination, a whole lot of help and passion. I spoke to, uh, on election night, 121 votes was the margin that elected the first ever Chinese American legislator in the history of Kansas. That election, though, we also stood up to the failed policies of Sam Brownback and Chris Kobach and elected a Democrat and a woman to be governor, Laura Kelly. Yeah. I cannot understate how devastating the Brownback tax experiment was to the state. Public education was cut. Funds were swept from our highway funds to make up for lost revenue, and essential services were slashed. This is no way to govern. This is the reason that an AAPI immigrant with a last name spelled XU stood up and filed to run for office. This is the reason that Kansas elected a Democratic governor, to fix this mess. I can tell you this, friends, that in the heart of America, the Democratic spirit is alive. In just one term, our Democratic governor has fully funded our schools for three straight years now. Our Democratic governor has helped secure record investment from the private sector, and most importantly, our Democratic governor has been the voice of reason on so many pieces of terrible legislation brought forth by Republicans. Five years ago, businesses were fleeing the state in search of greener pastures. Now, they're coming back in for the same reason. That is what a few years of democratic leadership can do. However, I sit in a legislative body where for every Democrat, there are 2.2 Republican members. Progress is constantly under attack. But we don't have time to be jaded and cynical. Every day, we have to wake up, roll up our sleeves, and have the backs of our neighbors because that's what they deserve. As a Democrat in the middle of the country, I can assure you that the children in our schools are tired of partisan attacks that prevents their classrooms from being fully funded. As a parent, I can assure you that our hearts break when we see vitriol and hate be spewed by GOP elected officials at LGBTQ youth over their identity and who they love. As a husband, father, and man, I can't imagine anyone providing better advice, care, and decisions for my wife and daughter than the doctor of their choosing. And as an immigrant, a proud member of the AAPI community, I can't sit by and watch the next generation face the same hate, fear, and discrimination that we see across America today. I cannot thank President Biden enough for signing the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to look out for my community and communities across the country. This party, the Democratic Party, has always been about holding true to the core concept enshrined in our founding documents, that an injustice to one is an injustice to us all. We can never lose sight of that truth. Our mission is to wake up every single day with a refreshed heart, willing to put it all on the line, yes, with hard work and determination to ensure that we make the United States of America the country we deserve. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. How are you feeling? Are you guys ready to win in 2022? Yes? Okay. Well, thanks for having me today. I'm Jenna Griswold, and I want to tell you something. When I ran for Colorado Secretary of State, it seemed impossible. A Democrat had it won in 60 years. And you know, folks like me don't tend to run statewide, and they sure don't tend to win statewide. You know, I grew up working class in rural Colorado, on and off of food stamps, in and out of food banks. My mom worked two jobs. We'd have, it would be tough to get by. I started working the summer after seventh grade and was the first person in my family to attend a four-year college and then law school. On top of all of that, I had never ran for office before. So there were a lot of reasons to think we can't win this race, but, but despite all the odds, in 2018, I became the first Democratic Secretary of State in Colorado, elected since Eisenhower was president. I became the first Democratic Secretary of State in Colorado ever, and the youngest Secretary of State in the nation. And my first year in office, I led the largest democracy reform package in the nation. We added drop boxes, we added voting centers, we passed parolee reenfranchisement, automatic voter registration. We took on corporations and special interests through campaign finance reform. And when the pandemic hit as the nation geared up for the most important election in American history, we were there. We knew voting rights faced an unprecedented risk both because of the pandemic and because of Donald Trump. And my friends, Democratic secretaries of state stood up to save American democracy in 2020. <laughs> Across the nation, we expanded vote by mail so Americans could have their voice heard in the middle of the pandemic. We expanded access, and we even took on President Trump, stopping him from disenfranchising American voters. Because of the heroic efforts of secretaries of state and election workers, the 2020 election was the most secure in American history with record turnout among both Democratic and Republican voters. In 2020, our democracy persevered. American voters were able to choose their elected officials. And my friends, that is exactly what is at risk right now. Across the United States, the right to vote is under attack. 2021 began, you guys know, it began with the insurrection on the United States Capitol, followed by over 500 bills to take away Americans' freedom to vote, to subvert elections. We're seeing insider attacks, historical vitriol against Republican and Democratic election workers. These voter suppression bills that have already passed remove drop boxes, empower partisan poll watchers, make it harder to vote by mail, reduce the number of polling places to try to stop Americans from having their voice heard. And now, in every swing state where we have a secretary of state race, extreme candidates who are either at the insurrection or lying about the 2020 election are running to be secretary of state. That would be like putting arsonists in charge of all the fire departments across the country. We cannot let it happen. And I'll tell you, in Colorado, even in Colorado, I'm running against someone who compromised her own, country, or her own county's voting equipment, is facing criminal felony charges, and applauded on stage as election deniers called for me to be hung for doing my job. My friends, Democracy is on the ballot in 2022. And it's going to take all of us, every single one of us, to ensure voters can make their voices heard this year. American elections need to be decided by American voters, not extreme politicians trying to tilt elections in their favor. That's why this fight for voting rights and democracy is not over. The very future of our nation is on the line. And that's what Democrats are fighting for. Democracy is on the ballot in 2022. And whether the issue you care most about is climate change, criminal justice reform, the rising cost of health care, or student loan debt, there is, will not be meaningful change if you cannot have your voice heard. We must protect the sacred right to vote to ensure a truly representative government 
of, by, and for the people. So we organize in 2022. We vote in 2022. In this moment of crisis, what gives me hope is the possibility of what can be achieved when we work together. Democracy is on the ballot in November, and it is up to every single one of us to save it. If you want to join me in defeating big lie candidates for Secretary of State, please go to JenniferColorado.com, and I look forward to saving democracy with every single one of you in November. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ruth C. Louis Jen, and I come from the great city and state of Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> I am just uh, shy of three months of uh, uh, being an elected, uh, uh, the first at-large city councilor of Haitian descent in Boston. Um, and I'm really excited to be with all of you. I want to thank all of you for the incredible work that you do organizing and building our party and being the moral compass um, of our political party across the country. So I just thank you for all of your work. Um, it's an honor to share this space with you all today to talk about the city that raised me and how I plan to spend my time as a city councilor now in my third month uh, fighting for those who have consistently been silenced. For me, the, the political is deeply personal, as I know it is for many of you. I grew up in a poor, working-class neighborhood in Boston. My parents came here as immigrants from Haiti, fighting for a better life for me and my three sisters. I watched my parents work several jobs to make ends meet and take care of us, our neighbors, extended family here and in Haiti. I don't know, I saw their pay stubs and I don't know how they did it on all of their responsibilities um, with the little that they had. As black immigrants, they navigated language barriers faced racism and discrimination in the workplace, and acclimated to extremely cold Boston winters. Although with the snow outside, DC, I don't know what y'all doing around this time, but anyways. Um, so that me and my sisters and I could have every opportunity to succeed. Their sacrifice makes my story possible. A public school kid from a working class family who would go on, go on to graduate from Harvard Law School, have a career as a lawyer and advocate, for affordable housing and voting rights and progressive causes. And now, as an elected, I use these skills for fi to fight for the communities that raised me. Stories like mine are possible when we invest and fight for communities like mine and we believe in each other's shared prosperity. And that's what we do here as Democrats. That's why the work that all of you do to bring immigrant communities into the political process and into accessing democracy is vital. That's why this administration's work to support DACA recipients is encouraging. It allows dreamers to dream big, assuaging their anxiety around status and opening them up to focus on building a prosperous life out of the shadows. We must always be the party and the people who embrace and support our immigrant communities. I see my parents' story as, as, of one of, as one of resiliency and a reflection of experiences shared by immigrant families across the country, in your communities, in your cities, and in your states, here in the stories that were shared by my uh, colleagues in service. The United States is a nation of immigrants from around the world, and while our experiences and our lived realities are different, we are bound by a shared, God-inspired obligation to be each other's keeper. As a city councilor, I see my role in caring for my community as twofold. First, doing everything in my power to bring the voices of those historically excluded to the center of the political conversation. Second, using, my leg using legislation to break down and rebuild political systems that have shut communities out, not only in Boston, but across the country. That's why we're all here today with the great resolutions that were passed. We're taking advantage of the unique opportunity to lead together to think critically about our work at the city, state, and federal level, to take care of our people through the political process. 
Boston is home to the third largest Haitian diaspora in our country. As the first Haitian American elected to Boston municipal government, it is well beyond time for the needs of our Haitian community to be met with actualized political power. I'm incredibly proud of the steps we've taken in Boston to support our immigrant communities, namely the Haitian-led nonprofit Immigrant Family Services Institute, known as IFSI, has been doing tremendous work on a shoestring budget to support Haitian and other border migrants. They work tirelessly to ensure that those new to our city are met with resources, warmth, and opportunity. While I was still a candidate, um, people were coming up to me to do work um, in the Haitian community and coming to me for opinions. That's how much we didn't have that representation and how important it is to have that once in office. Um, I helped our communities fight for government resources to support their work. Now, in Boston, there were some elected officials who believed that the organization run by Haitian people for Haitian people could not steward a multi-million dollar grant. They wished instead to steer the resources to a more established organization, not run by Haitians. I wasn't having it, especially because in the Haitian community, we knew that what would happen is that the large organization would receive the funds and then turn to the Haitian organization to ask questions about what to do with it. Um, with my background um, in advocacy and the support of many others, we succeeded in stewarding the resources to IFSI. When addressing any problem, we must center the people with lived experience as the experts on the solution. And we must deprogram any thinking that prevents us from investing in the capacity building of ground level organizations and grassroots movements. We must also show, always show, as a Democratic Party, that we are the party that is proud to stand firmly with immigrants and welcome them to our shores. We have more work to do to make this a reality. For example, continued use of the shameful Trump era policy of expelling border migrants under Title 42. As a country, we've done everything but, but welcome Haitian migrants. Last summer, Border Patrol agents on horseback use whips as they chase Haitian migrants. Our government has heard the pleas of asylum advocates, activists, public health officials, and elected officials, some of whom are here today. Shout out to the Massachusetts delegation who have been steadfast in their advocacy. Um, but, um, so, but we've decided to extend Title 42 instead of repealing it. Even our federal courts have called into question our use of Title 42 to deport migrants to harm. So one of the first things that I did as an elected, that my office did, is lead organizing efforts to convince our government to do the right thing. Cities in Massachusetts like Boston, Medford, Somerville, Cambridge, and other cities like uh, Irvington, New Jersey, and North Miami, Florida, have passed resolutions calling for the repeal of Title 42. The, Na the National Haitian Elected's Official Network has also been a consistent voice of moral clarity on this issue. Let me make it plain, it's beyond time that our use of this racist policy ends. We must be the party of working class folks. We must be the party of middle class folks, of BIPOC folks, and of our immigrants. Our policies must always, always align with our values and we must always lead with moral clarity, even when our voices shake. Treating Hampshire migrants with dignity would be a great first step. We have a lot of work to do, but I believe that doing the right thing, doing the just thing, Doing the anti-racist thing will always strengthen our party and truly capture the soul of this country. Thank you, and from my people I say, merci en pile. Let's give a round of applause for our, for our guests today. Thank you all so much for all that you do, for representing your constituents, and for fighting for democracy across this country. Thank you all. We will now take a little break for a few minutes.
please welcome DNC Chair Jamie Harrison. Have a seat, everyone. Please, please get to your seats. Have a seat, everyone. I please, please get to your seats. I need you to be seated. Take your seats, everyone. People in the back, please have a seat. Now, my friends, I want to turn things over to a special guest and a shining example of democratic leadership. My friends, Vice President Harris never backs down from a challenge. There is no issue too small, no obstacle too large. If it means helping the American people, she will be there. She's back from Europe, and she's so excited to address all of you. But we've got to get her fired up. So folks, I need you on your feet. Make some noise for this history-making boundary-breaking leader. Folks, it is now my honor to introduce our Vice President of these United States, Vice President Kamala Harris. Please have a seat. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Jamie, thank you for those kind words and for your continuous leadership. You've done such a, an outstanding job. And um, on behalf of the first, second gentleman of the United States and myself, <laughs> I want to say thank you to everybody in this room. Um, it is wonderful to see this group of friends in person. Um, this, of course, is the first time that we have been able to get together in person since the President and I were inaugurated. And I can just feel the energy in the room, which, of course, is reflective of the extraordinary dedication, commitment, and work that each of you have been doing over the course of the last couple of years, which presented, of course, many challenges because of the pandemic. But for so many of you, this is part of a lifetime of commitment to extraordinary work on behalf of so many people in our country. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you did to get us into the White House. <laughs> and to win control of the Senate, and to keep control of the House. You all did that work. And, you know, sometimes you make it look easy, but it's not. It's hard work. It's difficult work. It's around-the-clock work. It's work that requires great sacrifice in terms of the other commitments in your lives. And you do this work on behalf of people sometimes that you meet, on behalf of people that you don't meet. You do this work on behalf of people that may never know your names, may never know my name, but will be forever impacted and to our mission uplifted because of the work of the people in this room. And so when I think about where we are based on the work that has already happened to get us here, I know it has been hard work and good work. I also want to give a special shout out to the Californians in the room. Um, 
because how could I not? <laughs> but to everyone, thank you again. So I, I just returned this morning uh, from Poland and Romania. And um, I'll tell you that everything that you were watching on television, I know makes you understand and feel the importance of this moment on many levels. Uh, when I was meeting with our allies, I emphasized that the greatest strength that we share is unity, especially at this moment as we stand together in defense of democracy and stand together in defense of each other. And that unity and our collective resolve has been strengthened, of course, since Russia's re-invasion of Ukraine and Putin's war. Russia's invasion threatens not just Ukraine's democracy, it threatens democracy and security across Europe, and by extension, when democracy is threatened anywhere, it threatens us all. And the ocean that separates us will not leave us untouched by this aggression. So, I will say what I know we all say, and I will say over and over again. The United States stands firmly with the Ukrainian people in defense of the NATO alliance. And I'll tell you, while I was, um, while I was there the, these last couple of days, I met with the presidents of both nations, and I, and I met with refugees from Ukraine, some of who are Ukrainian citizens, others who were students studying in Ukraine from other countries. And, you know, um, they feel very alone, of course, because of the experience they've been having. Um, one of them was a 22-year-old student from Morocco who fled by himself, doesn't know anybody. And, um, and because of the experience they've had, they've of course not been in a room like this among the population the multitude of people who support them. And I told them, and so what you did to stand and, and applaud them in this point means a lot. I told them, people around the world stand with them and they are not alone. Um, when I was there, I met with a group of American troops who were there with a group of troops from Poland, working together, training together, attempting to understand each other's language, but yet speaking the same language in their fight for what is important about this moment. So again, I thank you all. Uh, days before I traveled to Poland, with many of you, I was in Selma to commemorate the 57th anniversary of the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That historic place, which is a stark reminder that we must always remain vigilant to safeguard freedom and democracy. Because we all know in this room, neither is assured without our vigilance. And defending democracy then takes all of us. As I said last week about the great Congressman John Lewis, This fight for democracy, for freedom, for equality, for justice requires of all of us, like John Lewis modeled, it requires from all of us a clarity of purpose and a determination and diligence to always keep our eye 
on the ball, understanding that in this fight for democracy, we must appreciate its character and nature. We must understand that when we have a democracy that reflects its values by treating people with a sense of equality and fairness and justice, we can see when it works, it possesses great strength. And we must always remember the duality of a democracy in that, yes, there is strength, but a democracy by its nature is also fragile, meaning it will only be intact if we fight for it and never take it for granted and be vigilant with a sense of clarity every day. And that's what we in this room stand for, all of us fighting and marching and pushing forward together to reach our ideals in the constant effort to create a more perfect union. You know, when the President and I took office, our country was facing the aftermath of a reckless president, the COVID-19 pandemic, and questions about America's leadership on the world stage. We had a plan to get America back on track with the support of the American people and the leaders in this room. We knew, all of us, our election should herald a change in direction, not just a change in management. And President Biden and I, then with your help and leadership, chartered a new course for our nation's future. And we rebuilt relationships with our allies. And the results of that effort are clear as we stand together in this unified rebuke of Russia. The President and I also proposed, with your leadership, with your help, the American Rescue Plan. <laughs> to fight through the impact of COVID. And since that plan was enacted last year, we went from 2 million people vaccinated to over 215 million vaccinated in our country. <laughs> Businesses are back open and 99% of our schools are no longer remote. We went from 60,000 jobs created each month to 678,000 jobs created last month and over 7 million total jobs created since we took office. Unemployment is down 3.8%. Black unemployment is at an all-time low, and Hispanic unemployment has fallen by historic amounts. The child tax credit cut childhood poverty for the children, the children, Latino children, black children, poor children, Appalachian children, by 40%. Because of your work and with your help, we passed a once-in-a-generation infrastructure law. And it will create more jobs. It will rebuild communities. I'm sorry, it will create more jobs, including good union jobs. That's right. That's right. Because we're clear on who helped build the middle class of America. We're clear on that. So yes, it will create more jobs, it'll rebuild communities, and do so much more to help America's families. For example, just last week, we announced nearly one and a half billion dollars in grants to help cities and towns electrify their fleet of public buses, build infrastructure to support their fleet, and train workers, thank you again, for all of the apprenticeships run by 
are unions that are training these workers with extraordinary skills to actually do the work. And think about it on the issue of public transit. So this will make tr public transit more reliable, more affordable, and more efficient. So imagine, if you will, a mother or a father trying to get out of the house during the week, in the morning, trying to get the kids to school and get to work. And then imagine for that parent, one of them kids don't want to put on their shoes. <laughs> Familiar experience. And so that parent misses the bus by just a few minutes. If the bus only comes by once an hour, those kids are going to be late for school. Mom or dad is going to be late for work. And that might mean having their pay docked or potentially even losing their job. Public transit. Working people in America in so many places in our country rely on it for all of their essential needs. This is about to change with an investment of billion dollars in billions of dollars in public transit. So when we look at this issue, it is one of many. But we're not going to stop there. And we didn't stop there. More than 70% of the judicial nominees we have appointed are women. More than 70%. And of course, the president recently nominated Judge Katanji Brown Jackson to the United States Supreme Court. And I'll share with you guys, going off script a little bit, I'll share with you guys. So the President and I were there at the White House for the day of the, of the, that he announced his nomination. And it, many of you may have watched it on television. And so we were in the back before we went out. And before we walked out, I just looked at our President and I said, you're again making history. You're again making history. Think about that. You know, when we, when we look at the job we have in the coming months, and people will look at all of us as leaders and they'll say, well, why should I vote? Why does it matter? There's so much we have to talk about. We have collectively, on many levels, achieved historic feats. And let's be proud of that, knowing, of course, that there is still more to do. Let's be proud of that. Be proud of that. And so, on the issue of Judge Jackson, she will make an outstanding and extraordinary jurist. And if confirmed, of course, she will be the first black woman on the highest court in the land. And don't let this be lost in terms of this point in history. And for the first time in history, four women will sit on the United States Supreme Court at the same time. How about that? How about that? So there's a whole long list I could go through, but you all know it. And you know, I know you've been meeting for a couple of days, so I'm not going to do that to you. Um, but I will say that together, we have accomplished so much. And of course, yes, there is more to do. As the President laid out in his State of the Union, it's time to bring down costs, the costs of living, even more. It is time to create more union jobs. It is time to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to succeed. It is time to defend our democracy and be vigilant in its defense and to safeguard our planet for generations to come. It is time to do so much more. And over the past year, I have traveled our country talking with many leaders, including those from, of course, this room, those from the Latino community, the black community, AAPI community, LGBTQ plus community, the disability community, all around our country. And we have talked about many of the issues that I know over the last couple of days this group has addressed. We have talked about one of the most urgent issues as well in terms of how the clock is ticking on a purposeful attack against our democracy being waged in states around our country, and that is on 
the attack on the freedom to vote. And we have talked about what we must do, us as leaders, all of us, understanding the intentions that are at play, which are to make it more difficult for people to vote, certain populations in particular, with an expectation that if you make it more difficult, then people won't vote. We have discussed together our frustrations and fears. We've talked about the rights that we fought so hard to win and how they could be lost. But I will say, as we talked about last week in Selma, we must fight on, because we know all of our rights and all of our progress depends on the freedom to vote. Workers' rights, women's rights, immigrant rights, LGBTQ rights, all of the rights that we hold so dear flow from the right to vote. So, the DNC, of course, has taken on a role of leadership on this issue, as well as all the others. And in this fight, making substantial investments, and thank you, in organizing, in strengthening state party infrastructure, and protecting voters. Last summer, I was proud to announce that the DNC would invest $25 million in its I Will Vote initiative to make voting more accessible, and to fight back against Republicans' unprecedented voter suppression efforts. As the tie-breaking vote in the Senate, I am the President of the Senate, I know as you do, I know as you do, that protecting our majorities on Capitol Hill is critical. And that is why President Biden announced that the DNC will transfer $15 million to the DCCC and the DSCC. So the work ahead is not going to be easy. Everybody knows that. That's why you all are here, knowing the work that must be done, knowing it's not going to be easy, but knowing we are under one roof together in solidarity and our commitment to seeing this through. I know and I believe we know when we show what we have accomplished just in a year and when we show it is because the American people voted, I believe we will meet the moment again. But that is our task. Our task is to show people that in many ways they got what they ordered, right? They said this is what they wanted. They stood in line. They took time from work. It was difficult. And a lot of what they demanded, they got. And so let's get out there as we do and remind them of that. Because we know that they will show up again. And they will say, yes, we want better jobs at higher wages. They will say yes to extending the child tax credit. They will say, yes, we must fight climate change. They will say, yes, I wanted and got and want more diversity on the court. They will say, yes, we must fight to protect reproductive rights. <laughs> we have faith in what they want and how much they want it and what they are prepared to do to get it. So our job is the job of just supporting the people, supporting their voices, supporting their will and desire of what their government has a responsibility to deliver, to uplift our nation and to strengthen it. That's at the core of the work we do. When we fight for social justice, when we fight for equal rights, when we fight for all that is on our list of priorities, that's our mission, to strengthen our nation. So that when I go overseas, when the president goes over the seas, when you talk to folks and we say America is a beacon, it is a model, that we can actually back that up. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. 
We are, as Democrats, continuing to own the responsibility that comes with being a role model, which is, as a democracy, to take care of its people, to see them, to hear them, and to be reflective of their priorities and their needs. So, DNC, we will keep working the phones. And we will keep registering the voters. And we will keep getting the souls to the polls. And we will keep doing all that is necessary to fight for the best of who we are. Thank you, DNC. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you all. All right, Democrats, we've got another fantastic speaker joining us today. My friends, our next speaker embodies what it means to fight for the communities he represents. He has been a tireless advocate for climate justice, a progressive voice for people who have felt forgotten and left behind. He served for 37 years in the U.S. House of Representatives before being elected in 2013 to the U.S. Senate, and the people of Massachusetts are certainly lucky to have him. Please join me in welcoming a fighter, a champion for the most vulnerable, a defender of our democracy, the senator from the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, U.S. Senate. Senator Ed Markey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to Washington, D.C. And it's an honor for me to share the same stage as our great historic Vice President Kamala Harris. Wasn't she great? Up on Capitol Hill, we tend to see a lot of the Vice President because she breaks the ties of 50 to 50 in the United States Senate. And every time she comes into our chamber, we win another big issue for the American people. But I know that with every tie-breaking vote she casts, she further cements herself as our irreplaceable partner and as the history-making leader we all know she is for our country. From her leadership on broadband access and ensuring all our children have access to the 21st century tools they need to succeed in school, to her statesmanship now in Eastern Europe with our allies, we are all safer and more secure because of the wisdom of Vice President Harris. And we're so fortunate to have Jamie Harrison leading the DNC in this most historic and meaningful of times. And a special shout out, a special shout out to all of the attendees from my home state of Massachusetts and our Democratic Party Chairman Gus Bickford. The saying goes that in Massachusetts, 
you're born a Democrat and Red Sox fan, and then you're baptized Catholic seven days later. So to this great family of Massachusetts Democrats, it's so great to be with you. I learned my values from my father and mother at my childhood kitchen table, the same table where my mother paid the monthly bills, balanced the checkbook, figured out how long we could keep the heater on during the cold winter nights. My father drove a truck. The first time I visited Washington in my life was to be sworn in as a congressman. I had never been there. And today, we know that families are sacrificing to keep the lights on, food on the table, a roof overhead. Americans are hurting with higher costs at the grocery store, at the pharmacy, at the gas pump, and they want their children to be able to maximize their God-given abilities the same way I was able to and all of you in this room. That is what the Democratic Party stands for. And we know, we know that if we want people to live like Republicans, we have to vote like Democrats to give everyone the opportunity to be able to make it in our country. Bringing those costs down, creating fairness and justice, growing our economy, protecting the fundamental rights that make our democracy the greatest in the world, these are the generational challenges we face as Democrats and Americans. But I believe that under the leadership of President Biden, we are meeting that challenge. It is hard work, but we are doing it. When confronted with a coronavirus pandemic that was taking lives and livelihoods, we passed the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan and infused billions of dollars into our small businesses and cities and towns all across our country. We ramped up vaccination production and ensured that our hospitals and healthcare workers had the resources they needed. When confronted with crumbling roads, bridges, highways, and reimagining of a 21st century transportation system, we passed a $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law. This is the single largest investment in repairing and reconstructing our nation's bridges since the construction of the interstate highway system in the 1950s. And it makes the largest federal investment in public transit in history, and it will create millions of new union jobs in our country to get all of that built. And when confronted with a judicial system tainted by two stolen Supreme Court system, uh, seats and a Trump-stacked court system, the Biden administration has seen 46 federal judges confirm so far the most of any president in their first term since Ronald Reagan and twice as many as Donald Trump appointed in his first year. And we won't stop there because next month, we will take the historic step of confirming the first female black Supreme Court justice in our nation's history. When Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's appointment goes to the Supreme appointment to the Supreme Court, we will take a long overdue step to ensure that the court looks a lot more like and better represented all of America. The Biden administration has created more than 7 million new jobs, including the largest year of job growth in the history of the United States of America. We are up to 76% of Americans vaccinated. We rejoined the Paris Agreement. We finally made lynching a federal crime. We ended the ban on openly transgender people serving in the military. We made June 13th a national holiday. And no, no, this is by no means all the work that we have to do. But these are important steps, and they represent what our Democratic Party stands for. And where have Republicans been during all of this, during this fight for our economy and our democracy. They have been in the greatest witness protection program in American history. They've done nothing to help our families and our workers, and they've ignored the very real and very dangerous threats 
to our democracy emanating from their very own party. They've blocked legislation to protect voting rights. They've blocked legislation to guarantee the right to an abortion. They've blocked legislation to ensure equal work for equal play. They've blocked legislation to lower drug prices. When GOP wasn't standing for get old people, it was standing for gut our protections for ordinary families. When GOP wasn't standing for gang of polluters, Donald Trump made it stand for gullible on Putin. But that's, but that's the GOP's political paradox. Republicans hate the government, but they have to run for office in order to make sure that it does not work. The head of the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, Senator Rick Scott, recently rolled out his version of the GOP agenda. And of course, it included a tax increase on half of America. And it also imposed massive cuts on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and education. It was so unpopular that even Mitch McConnell rejected it. That's like Darth Vader telling Hannibal Lecter to tone it down. It's just too much. And now, and now, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Republicans in their oil-soaked cronies at the American Petroleum Institute, the American Prevarication Institute, want to feed the American people one of the biggest lies of all. And that drilling for more oil and more gas is the path to energy independence. Republicans say that they have an all of the above plan, but it's really an oil above all plan. The GOP always has stood for the gas and oil party. And its argument of drilling equals energy independence is leakier than an old oil tanker. Their push to use the crisis in Ukraine to line big oil's pockets is not about addressing inflation at home. It's about inflating fossil fuel profits at home. The American people want change in our energy policy, change in our investments, change in our climate policy. In short, America is due for an oil change. We will not beat, we will not beat Putin with his gas in our cars. We are so proud that President Biden has organized our allies in isolating Putin and his oil gawks. President Biden has been brilliant in unifying the world against this unprovoked and unwarranted attack on Ukraine. President Biden has told the Ukrainian people that he stands with them and we all stand with them. And now, thanks to the president, we are going to ban all oil and natural gas and coal imports from Russia. And with aggressive investments in clean, renewable energy, we can make that ban permanent and then extend it extended to all of the countries whose regimes engage in human rights abuses and fossil-fueled conflict. It is time we tell Russia and Saudi Arabia that we do not need their oil any more than we need their caviar or their sand. It's time for us to unleash an innovation revolution in our country because America's future will not be found in the dirty energy of the past, but in the clean innovation of the future. And that future starts today with massive investments in wind and solar and offshore wind and battery storage and all electric vehicles and energy efficiency. That is the Biden plan for our country. With 16 million, just 16 million all electric vehicles, we back out all of the oil we import from Russia. The next 16 million all-electric vehicles backs out all the oil we import from Saudi Arabia. Instead of drill, baby, drill, it should be plug in, baby, plug in. Because we know, we know that there's a revolution that we have to put in place. Joe Biden saved the country, and I know, we know, 
that he wants to save the world as well. We know we cannot treat, teach temperance from a bar stool, so the United States must lead the globe in the clean energy revolution to protect us all from Russia, yes, but also from the existential threat of climate change caused by dirty fuels. That's the Biden agenda. Sadly, we know that Kevin McCarthy, Mitch McConnell, and Donald Trump and his Republican Party aren't going to back down, not now, not ever, and we need to send them all a special message from the Democratic Party. We don't back down, not now, not ever. We are right and they are wrong on every single one of those major issues. This is what is at stake because we will not achieve these goals unless we protect and expand the Democratic majorities in the House and in the Senate. And I know we can do it. I know we can keep the trifecta of President Biden, Leader Schumer, and Speaker Pelosi. I know we can do it, and you are the army that is going to make this possible as you leave here and go back to your home states. But the Democratic Party is not going to win in 2022 only because of a message. We're going to win because of a movement, an intergenerational, intersectional, interconnected movement of rural and urban, young and old, black, brown, immigrant, native, refugee, male, female, non-binary, and most of all, mobilized and galvanized Americans in all 50 states in our country. And that movement starts with you. So I'm here to ask every person here today, will you stand with President Biden and Kamala Harris and the Democratic Party for opportunity, for justice, and for democracy? Will you stand with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for immigrant rights so that dreamers and their families don't have to live in fear every single day? Will you stand with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in support of our workers and unions and their right to organize and collectively bargain? Will you stand with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to pass universal background checks, close the gun show loophole, and make NRA stand for not relevant anymore in American politics? Will you stand with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for criminal justice reform? We owe an apology to an entire generation of African-American young men who were incarcerated as a result of the failed war on drugs. Black voices matter. Black votes matter. Black lives matter. That is our message. And now is the time. You are the people. And as much as we have to be proud of what we have already done, we have more work left to do. I thank everyone here for ensuring that we're fighting for a more fair, more just, healthier, cleaner, safer world for everyone in our country and all across our planet. Thank you all so much for everything that you are doing. Everyone, join me in thanking Senator Markey. Thank you again, Senator. And once again, let's thank our amazing Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Before my grandfather passed in 2004, we always used to vote together. That was our little tradition. It was actually one of the last things we did together before he passed away. He was in a wheelchair at the time, so I wheeled him to the polls, we voted, and then we came home. Afterwards, we were sitting out on the porch talking about whatever, and after a while, the conversation got serious. He grabbed my arm and he said, Baldy, we voted today, and you know, I couldn't always vote in the state. He said, you know, growing up in South Carolina, they didn't always see your grandmother and me as whole people. I said, yes, sir, I know that. He said, let me tell you something. Never let anybody tell you that you don't matter. Never let anybody tell you or say that you don't count. 
And that is what is so special about the vote. It is the great equalizer. It doesn't matter if you're president or if you pave roads like my grandfather, you get one vote. And that vote is proof that you count. Hello, my friends. Hello, my Democratic family. You know, as I begin my remarks today, I want to echo what the president and vice president said. The American people are behind Ukraine. And we know that freedom will prevail. I'm grateful for the president and the vice president's leadership during this time. And I'm proud to see how the world has united against tyranny. My friends, as chair, it is such an honor to welcome you to the nation's capital. It is good to just be back with friends and family. Let me also wish all of you a happy Women's History Month. I'm so appreciative and we all are all so thankful for Vice President Kamala Harris and all of the Democratic women leaders in this room and across the nation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to congratulate our constituency and regional caucus members who've been elected this week. For our new DNC members, welcome to the Democratic National Committee winter meeting. For those that are returning, it's so good to see you again. My friends, our job is twofold. We've got to sell our accomplishments to the American people. And you heard the president make that case the other night. And that's a good case that he made. The American Rescue Plan, the bipartisan infrastructure law, historic job growth and economic recovery, a real plan to continue bringing down costs and fighting inflation. Another equally important part of our job is defining our opposition. So here's the thing, folks. There's only one party. Only one party that is united against Russian aggression. There's only one party. One party fighting for working families. There's only one party. One party that believes in union power. There's only one party. One party that thinks billionaires and the biggest corporations ought to pay their fair share. There's only one party. One party fighting tooth and nail against voter suppression. One party committed to reproductive freedom. One party that isn't afraid of our nation's history. The Republican Party isn't the party of Reagan anymore. A man who told the Soviet Union to tear down that wall. The Republican Party isn't the party of Lincoln anymore, a man who fought to hold our country together. The Republican Party, it's the party of Trump, a man who is soft on Russia. It's the party of Madison Cawthorn, a man who demonizes a Ukrainian president who is fighting like hell for the survival of his nation. The Republican Party, it's the party of Ted Cruz, a man who flees to Cancun, Mexico when his constituents in Texas needed him most. The Republican Party, it's the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene, who doesn't see a problem with speaking at white nationalist conferences. The Republican Party, it's a party of Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott, who will stoop so low that they attack our queer and trans kids. The Republican Party is the party of Kevin McCarthy, a man who would rather count Starbursts for Donald Trump than kick the white supremacists out of his caucus. The Republican Party is the party of Ron Johnson, who wants to prioritize uh, repealing the Affordable Care Act and taking away health care from millions of Americans. 
the Republican Party. It's the party of Rick Scott, who wants to raise taxes on half of Americans. The Republican Party is a party built on fraud, fear, and fascism. The Republican Party is a party that turns a blind eye to the attack on our capital, where police were beaten, the vice president and speaker's lives were threatened, and a tribute to the late, great John Lewis was destroyed. A party that sees that tragic day as legitimate political discourse. My friends, this country can't afford Republican leadership. And that's why the DNC has made more investments earlier than ever before to elect Democrats across the country. It's why we committed nearly $48 million to state parties and increased our state party partnership program investments by 25%. Thank you. It's why 39 states have already received additional funding on top of our state, partner, uh, state party partnership program. It's why we are already advertising on black radio well before election day, and we'll stay on air from now until November. And that's in addition to the work that we've already been doing to reach voters in new ways, from working with influencers on TikTok to funding translation services so that our state parties can reach our voters in over 200 languages. Our coalitions team is already launching several signature programs so that we can mobilize every community and every constituency that our party represents. Let me name a few. Women for the win. Our values, our voice, our vote to engage black communities across the country. Vamos Democratas, to mobilize Latino voters. Margin of victory for our AAPI Democrats engage, empower, and activate the native vote. Democrats are out and proud to mobilize queer and trans Democrats. A fair shot for young Democrats who aren't just the future of our party, but an important piece right now. And our Disability Council has now become a caucus, and we still have more signature programs that we will roll out. My friends, this is just one piece of all the work that we're doing at the DNC. If you want to get involved in organizing and mobilizing the diverse communities that make up our party, I need you to do one thing. I need you to text ENGAGE, E-N-G-A-G-E, -E, to 43367. We've got to spend every day from now until election day taking our message to the American people. And I need you to be all in, folks, in everything that you do. And that includes the financial support, and I mentioned that earlier. I also want to make sure that the outstanding work that you all do is celebrated and appreciated. And that's why I am proud to announce that I will be forming a chair's advisory group on awards. You know, I'm a big believer in celebrating excellence, a big believer in celebrating the hard work of each and every one of you and the volunteers that we have across this country. So when an organizer single-handedly makes a difference in their region, when a state party finds new ways to hold the GOP accountable, when a volunteer goes above and beyond, we're going to make sure that they know how valuable they are to the Democratic Party. My friends, our coalition is diverse, and we won't always agree on everything. But right now, it's the time for unity. So holding on to our majorities in November, it ain't going to be easy. It will not be easy. But if we're not working together, if we're wasting time on petty disagreements, it will be impossible. I know we got reporters in this room right now, and every single one of them has written something that says that we are going to fail this November. Everybody has counted us out. The Republicans think November is going to be a cakewalk. They are measuring the drapes already. Kevin McCarthy has even more starbursts that he's counting out in his office. The pundits have basically assumed we are going to be in the minority. Folks, 
I grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Son of a teen mom who couldn't go to college. I went to Yale and Georgetown. My whole life, my whole life, people have told me what I can't do. They told me a black man can't be chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. They told me I would never make it as DNC chair. But here's my secret, my friends. That only makes me work harder. That only makes me want to prove them wrong again and again and again. They told Georgia, they told Georgia that you can't win a runoff election if you are a Democrat in Georgia. And hell, they didn't win one, they won two. They said incumbent presidents don't lose re-election. Well, there's an incumbent president that's golfing right now. But folks, here's the secret. We are going to make history because we are going to prove them wrong yet again. Folks, we got the team to do it. We got the state parties to do it. We have the volunteers to do it. We have the grassroots donors to do it. We have the young people to do it. We have a diverse coalition that looks like this great nation, and we will do it. So let's get our president the majority he needs in Congress to move his bold and popular agenda. Let's elect Democrats up and down the ballot so our neighbors and our loved ones have leaders that actually care about them. Let's make our own histories so that folks think twice before they count the Democratic Party out. I want to just thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all again for being here this week. It has been an honor to be in this fight with each and every one of you. You know, the motto in South Carolina is, while I breathe, I hope. While I breathe, I hope. It's a powerful motto because it's equating life itself with that notion of hope. Bishop talked about the hope early. We saw years of bigotry, division, and hate in this country. And 81 million folks said enough is enough, we're going to step up for hope. And they went to the ballot and they voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Well, folks, our charge over these next eight months, it's not while I breathe, I hope, because in my faith, I know faith without works is dead. We're going to do the work and we are going to bring hope to all parts of this nation. So it won't be the motto of the Democratic Party, while I breathe, I hope, but it will be the motto of the Democratic Party, while I breathe, I vote, because that is how we bring hope to Arizona. That is how we bring hope to the District of Columbia. That is how we bring hope to Florida. That is how we bring hope to the Virgin Islands. That is how we bring hope all over this globe. My friends, our charge, our charge is to bring hope back to this great nation. And we will, and we will do it by going to the polls in a way that we have not gone before to make sure that bigotry and hatred and division will not win, but hope and aspiration will. Thank you all for being Democrats. Thank you for standing up for the least of these. Thank you for winning and showing the world, showing the world that you can never count out the Democratic Party. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, at the October uh, 21, uh, 2021 DNC meeting, I committed to appointing an additional female member to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And I'm pleased to appoint Susan Swecker, chair of the Virginia Democratic Party, to fill that position. Susan has been a DNC member since 2004 and has served as co-chair of the Credentials Committee 
member of the 2005 Herman Price Commission on Presidential Nomination uh, Timing and Scheduling. She's been on the Rules and Bylaws Committee, and she is chair, has been chair of the Southern Caucus. She has also been an integral partner to the Democratic Party at all levels. Her experiences range from chair of the Highland County Democratic Committee to the executive director of the Democratic Party of Virginia to her current position as chair of the Democratic Party of Virginia. Susan's experience is extensive, and she will be a strong stalwart of the Democratic Party in this important position. At this time, the chair recognizes Lorraine Miller of Texas. My high honor and personal privilege to place in the nomination the name of Susan Swiker of the Commonwealth of Virginia to return as a member of the August Rules and Bylaws Committee. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm so delighted she will provide the insight and her voice to our committee uh, deliberations and will help us in the presidential nominating process to a successful conclusion and help us win in 2024. With that, Mr. Chairman, go Susan Swank. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Chair recognizes Iris Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I second the nomination. We have a motion and a second to ratify the appointment of Susan Swecker to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. All those in favor of ratifying the chair's appointment say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and Susan Swecker is now a member of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. I will now ask our secretary, Jason Ray, to come up to make any announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we uh, are so thankful again for your taking the time to participate in this meeting today and for traveling. We wish you safe travels back home. Before we leave today, I know there are many questions about when our next meeting is. Staff is working hard right now to schedule our next full in-person meeting, and we'll get that out to folks uh, as soon as we can. But as we begin to wrap today, please just give a round of thanks to all of our DNC staff who have worked tirelessly to put this meeting on. Um, we could not do it without their hard work and dedication. So a tremendous thank you to our entire DNC staff. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to the hotel staff here at the Hilton as well. Uh, we couldn't do this. Thank you for the security who also has been provided here by our security staff at the DNC and also for the local security. We really appreciate it. I now want to introduce Representative Ruth Buffalo to deliver our benediction. Hello, everyone. I want to um, be respectful of your ancestors as well as my ancestors and introduce myself in the Hidatsa language. I am a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. Grew up on the reservation in a small rural community called Mandaree. And so, Nido Shadzi Nakbaga O, Madashi Mia Adesh Heads, Ma Be Sigids, Ma Zigirads Nakbaga O. It has been an absolute honor to be here with all of you on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans and the neighboring ancestral lands of the Pic Pis sorry, Piscataway and Pamanke peoples. I am leaving here more energized than before and ready to continue hitting the ground running as I return to North Dakota. I'm proud to be a part of a group who puts the needs of the people front and center a party who works to find upstream solutions to prevent further tragedies. I'm thankful for the recent passage of the Violence Against Women Act that directly impacts our tribal communities. And we must continue to work to ensure that our indigenous brothers and sisters have equal access to the ballot box. 
As the granddaughter of boarding school survivors and decades of harmful extermination policies, as the daughter of a boarding school survivor and U.S. Air Force men, as a boarding school survivor, we know a better world is possible. A world free of greed and violence. A world full of healing, love, and respect. In order for us to truly embody hope and healing, we must always work towards speaking truth and acknowledging historic harms, the impacts of which are still felt today. Telling the truth is an act of courage and radical love. Let us never forget our most vulnerable, our political prisoner, our incarcerated relatives, and the mourners who have lost loved ones long before their time. In closing, I will share a prayer with you that was shared with me from one of our spiritual leaders and Arikara elder, Willard Yellowbird. Creator, whose voice we hear in the wind, whose breath gives life to all of the world, hear us, we need your strength and wisdom. Let us walk in your beauty and make your eyes behold the red and purple sunset. Make our hands respect the things you have made and our ears sharp to hear your voice. Make us wise so that we may understand the things you have taught us. Help us to remain calm and strong in the face of all that comes towards us. Let us learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Help us seek pure thoughts and act with the intention of helping others. Help us find compassion without empathy overwhelming us. We seek strength not to be greater than our brothers and sisters, but to fight our greatest enemy, ourselves. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes, so when life fades as the fading sunset, our spirit may come to you without shame. Madzigirads nakbaga o. Thank you. My friends, that concludes our business for today's DNC meeting. Give me a second, Trav. <laughs> I want to once again thank the many DNC staff who have helped to make today's meeting run smoothly. Everyone has been working around the clock, and we are so lucky to have such a talented and committed staff, and we couldn't do any of this without them. <laughs> so we, again, have completed our business today, and as such, the chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Trav Robertson, for a motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> we have a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. All opposed, nay. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for a great meeting. Let's get it started in here.